Last time, we found the last piece of our decision tree puzzle. In order to identify promising splits and successfully grow our tree, our impurity heuristic must be concave. Now that we have a good idea of what makes a good impurity function, let's pick one. We decided last time that we still wanted our impurity function to equal zero for completely pure nodes. That is when p, our positive class fraction, equals zero or one. And that our impurity function should reach a maximum when p equals one half. The simplest function many of us learn in school that fits this description is an upside-down parabola. One parabola with the roots we need at 0 and 1 is p times p minus 1. And to make it upside-down, we can just add a negative sign out front. This is not an exotic or exciting impurity function, but it does meet all of our requirements. We can make it a little more interesting by distributing the minus sign to our p minus 1 term and multiplying by 2 to make our parabola reach the same maximum value as our unsuccessful linear impurity function. The resulting function turns out to be the impurity heuristic of choice among our statistics researchers, and has even been given a special name, the Gini impurity. One interesting interpretation of the Gini impurity is as the misclassification error rate if instead of assigning majority labels to each node, we had instead assigned probabilities to each node based on class frequencies. Now, when our machine learning researcher, Ross Quinlan, set out to create his decision tree algorithm in the late 1970s, he set out down quite a different path. Borrowing from the pervasive field of information theory, Quinlan chose to measure the information gained by each possible split, and choose the split with the greatest gain. Now, we must be careful here. Like most scientific terms, the word information used in the context of information theory has a narrow and technical definition that is only marginally related to the way you or I may use the word in conversation. And as Claude Shannon, the father of information theory himself, pointed out in 1956, Information theory is a tool primarily designed by and for communications engineers, and we must use caution when applying information theory to other fields. The communication systems information theory was designed for are often modeled in three parts, a transmitter, a channel, and a receiver. The transmitter sends messages over the channel to be interpreted by the receiver. A critical piece of information theory is the connection between the probability of receiving a given message and the information contained in that message. In his seminal work, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, Shannon argues that the way we should measure the information contained in a message is as the logarithm of 1 over the probability of the message occurring. Further, we can average the information contained in multiple messages by taking a weighted average over message probabilities. That is, multiplying the probability of each message by the information contained in the message and adding. The result, the average information content, gets a special name, entropy. So what could all this possibly have to do with node impurity when choosing the best split in decision trees? Why did Ross Quinlan choose to borrow from information theory? Well, for one, despite Shannon's warning, information theory has been successfully applied across many fields that have nothing to do with communications. And secondly, we can make a reasonable argument that measuring the information gained by a possible split is a natural way to build decision trees. To do this, we must, of course, generalize the tools of information theory to fit our problem. To measure the information gained by a given split, we need to generalize the concept of average information content, entropy. Instead of strictly defining entropy to be the information content averaged across different messages, let's allow entropy to be the information content averaged over the elements of a set. In this case, our set is the examples contained in a given node. To compute the average information content, the entropy of a given node, we treat our node as a transmitter capable of sending two messages, positive or negative. The probability of each message corresponds to the frequency of each class within our node. So for the left node of our x3 split, the probability of a positive message is two-thirds, and the probability of a negative message is one-third. We can now compute the entropy of this node by plugging into our formula and obtain our first entropy measurement, 0.92 bits. Now, since our entropy, our average information content, only depends on the frequency of positive and negative examples in our node, we can express our entropy in terms of our key variable from last time, our positive class fraction, p. Since our positive and negative class fractions must add to 1, we can write our negative class fraction as 1 minus p. 
So we now have a new function, brazenly stolen from information theory, that we hope captures something meaningful about the information contained in any given node of our decision tree. Now that we have this new metric, what should we do with it? As we grow our tree, are we looking to create nodes with high or low entropy? To get a better sense for our new metric, let's plot it. We know p can take on any value from 0 to 1, so let's visualize our entropy function between these values. Our resulting plot should look suspiciously similar to a result from earlier. In fact, if we scale down our new entropy function by a factor of 2, we see that our entropy is incredibly similar to our Gini impurity. Both curves equal 0 when our nodes contain only positive or negative examples, both curves reach a maximum when p equals 1 half, and both curves are concave. So our dive into information theory has led us to an incredibly similar result to our much simpler Gini impurity. Which, depending on your interpretation, either means we've completely wasted our time, or that we're really onto something. Now, remember that Ross Quinlan's original idea here was to measure the information gained by each split, and choose the split that made the largest gain. Now that we have a measure of the average information content, the entropy of each node, we can measure the information gained exactly in the same fashion as we measured the decrease in node impurity. By subtracting the weighted average of our entropy after splitting from our entropy before splitting. Our new formula for the information gained turns out to have a lot in common with other problems in machine learning and information theory. And depending on how we set up our problem also shows up under the names kolbeck leibler divergence, relative entropy, and mutual information. Now, I think it's important to remember here that no matter how fancy a name we give our new equation, for us it's still just a heuristic, an educated guess. As we'll see shortly, information gain works unreasonably well when growing decision trees. And what's truly remarkable here is that no one really knows why. Sure, we can make reasonable arguments as to why heuristics like Gini impurity and information gain should work well. But at the end of the day, there appears to be no deep underlying significance here. No rigorous proof. No supporting mathematical framework. Or perhaps we just haven't discovered it yet. This brings us to our final big point. In machine learning, heuristics rule. It's easy to forget that machine learning just hasn't been around that long. And many of the techniques used in practice are simply heuristics. They just work. This can be both frustrating and liberating. Although machine learning can appear dense, rigorous, and impenetrable from the outside, once you find the right angle of attack, it often quickly becomes apparent that much of what we know about machine learning came from clever, but more importantly, persistent researchers making educated guesses. Now, it's time to build our tree. We have two split heuristics, information gain and Gini impurity to choose from. We have a greedy approach to growing our tree that should allow us to find a good solution quickly. We have judiciously chosen to use a small number of our 81 total pixels to ensure we strike the right balance between bias and variance and avoid overfitting. We're finally ready. As we grow our tree, at each node we must consider splitting on each of our 81 variables. For each possible split, we'll show a subset of the examples that end up in each node, and keep track of our positive class fractions PL and PR. To measure the quality of each split, we'll use our information gain heuristic, and we'll keep track of the information gained by each split in a 9x9 nine nine grid, where darker shades of blue represent higher information gains. Alright, ready? After we test each of our 81 possible splits, we'll choose the split that gains the most information and move on to the next node. Now we could grow our tree to whatever depth we would like, but for now let's stop at 3. Notice that all of our leaves end up with a majority of negative examples, except for one. Following our majority class labeling strategy, we'll call examples that end up in any of our majority negative leaves non-fingers. And we'll call examples that end up in our majority positive leaf fingers. This means that using our decision tree, powered by our information gain heuristic, we've learned one rule to identify finger pixels in images. Fingers are examples with a 1 in the x40 position, a 0 in the x0 position, and a 0 in the x53 position. 
And what's really remarkable here is how good this rule is, and how quickly we were able to find it. Back in part 12, we tested all 682,560 possible 3-pixel rules, and sorted these rules by performance. And if we look carefully, we see that the rule our decision tree found is actually the fourth best performing rule out of 682,560. And what's even more remarkable here is the tiny number of rules our decision tree tested before landing on this result. Remember that at each node, our decision tree tested 81 possible rules. So across our seven nodes, our decision tree incredibly tested just 567 rules. So our decision tree, guided by our information gain heuristic, found the fourth best rule out of 682,560 after only considering 567 rules. Incredible. We have finally found a method to efficiently and reliably identify fingers in images. Of course, finding this method was anything but straightforward. Tasked with identifying finger pixels and images from 9x9 binary pixel grids, we first tried a knowledge engineering approach. That is, writing rules that captured our understanding of what fingers look like. After a little experimenting, this approach proved brittle and essentially impossible to scale. We then borrowed a powerful idea from the IBM researcher Arthur Samuel, and set up programming our computer to learn what fingers looked like from real finger data. We first tried simply memorizing our finger examples. This strategy performed amazingly well on data it had already seen, and terribly on data it hadn't. It didn't generalize. To figure out why, we then simplified our problem by working with toy data, only to discover that the very thing we set out to do, learn from data, is a fundamentally ill-posed problem. There is no one correct answer. We then dug deeper into exactly how organisms like humans can learn so effectively when learning itself appears to be ill-posed and discovered that learning was really about striking a critical balance between two conflicting goals, training set performance and generalization. New knowledge in hand, we then set out to conquer the world with machine learning, only to discover that just because we knew a good solution existed did not mean we had the computational means to find it. We then turned to our machine learning and statistics researchers for a computationally efficient solution, greedily grown decision trees. We quickly learned that although the basic idea of growing decision trees in a greedy fashion is relatively straightforward, choosing a method to guide our growth is not. This led us to discover the key role heuristics play in machine learning, and that the heuristic we really needed to guide our search was a concave function, such as Gini impurity or information gain. Armed with these remarkable discoveries, we then trained our very own decision tree, allowing us to quickly find a rule that reliably identified finger pixels and images. And finally, using our new rule and a simple algorithm to group finger pixel detections together, we were able to accomplish something incredible. Something Leibniz and Descartes only dreamed of. Something Minsky and Sussman failed to accomplish. Something only made possible through remarkable discoveries in the fields of statistics and machine learning over the last 50 years. Our algorithm has, in a limited but very real sense, learned to see. Thanks for watching.